Minasan, is everyone okay? I hope you are, um, because after that I can't promise you on anything. Anyway, today's movie is about system monitors. Are you guys ready? Are you, like, totally ready? So, let's do this. Um, I just love being over dramatic, I guess. Hello. Um, I guess the most important matter is how's possible to rain without getting wet? It's called feature incomplete. Speaking of which, time to travel back in time on an application that is feature incomplete after of about 15 years in development. Gnome 2.32, and please don't start with the memories. Move on for a better mental health. It's Fedora 14 and Linux 2.6. And this was the system monitor back then. System info on the first page, then it was the processes, then the resources, and the file systems in the end. Does that remind you of something? Fedora 15 and GNOME 3.0. Actually, this is the fallback mode because Shell was crashing and it couldn't be started, which was something usually happening in April of 2011. But the point is, the system monitor had been ported on GTK3 already. Even if it was tougher to move something from GTK2 to GTK3, rather to move something from GTK3 to GTK4. But the rest are the same. Um, system info, processes, resources, and file systems with the identical design on lists and graphs. September 2013. Fedora 20 and GNOME 3.10. This is the first release of System Monitor that comes with header bars. The info page is now gone, but the rest remain the same. Processes, resources, and file systems. For GNOME 45, which is the current release, the System Monitor is still on GTK3. It looks very alike. And even if some things have been updated under the hood, the experience remains pretty much the same as 15 years back. For example, GPU monitor, NOP, applications group, NOP. Not to mention application usage, which is on Android, um, since ever. GNOME 46 is releasing in March 2024, but the system monitor has already been ported to GTK4 on main branch, so this is definitely good news. But there is always a but, all the rest are the same pretty much. And I wouldn't be exactly super excited about the future of this app. Not because resources view is crashing with a C++ buffer overflow, mm, but because um, system monitor is a zombie process itself. It is very impressive, it even works. If people actually are using it to verify, it really works because nobody is contributing for the last 10 years. And I, um, I can't see what will be different in the next 10 years. Can you? Alan apparently can. He keeps pushing mock-ups for a system monitor. Um, can you please give me a second to find them? So here we are. And on the first sketch, it's a design for a completely different monitor that is basically based on usage. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Because on the second sketch, we have a contingency plan. If the first won't happen, we still can get a somewhat revamped monitor with minimal changes, new graphs and resources view, and a modernization of the window with libidweta widgets. That seems very doable for the next GNOME release since the GTK4 port is already here. But let's go back to that, and you may need to receive some context for better understanding what's going on on GNOME upstream, considering the application's development at least. So. Six years ago, there was again a movement and designs for creating a new system monitor, and this time it had an initial implementation too, and it even became a GNOME module on 3.28 release. But usage was written in Vala, and when you write something in Vala, you're also making a statement at the same time. A statement that says that you can't be possibly serious about the software you develop, clearly. And so, in less than a year, the excitement and the motivation got lost, and usage went to emergency room to meet the rest GNOME Core apps. If you don't know, the analytics situation of usage applies to every GNOME app from those that aren't sponsored. A developer most usually is super active for a development cycle, 
Then they hibernate for several releases, and then it might be another active period, and so on. The result is a set of extremely outdated apps, not outdated in look, but outdated in features. When the official calculator will get an AI prompt, I'm wondering, and if that sounds too much, the image app after two years in development can't even do crop? Once, Boxes was my favorite GNOME app because I was loving watching Linux distros. Today, I don't trust it anymore to run anything, and even if somehow someday Boxes will magically get improved, I don't think I will care and invest time to learn it again. GNOME apps should try very, very hard to gain my trust again, and I believe that relates to many GNOME users. Some of them have a bored ship, but hey, I'm still here, believing. Okay, it is unfair to say that Vala developers aren't serious, because nobody would work on upstream apps if they were serious about their software. But pushing Vala in GNOME GitLab is combo. It's like a prank. Please don't read that wrong. It is very normal to happen. If, for example, you want to develop a talking calculator, you know you can't do that upstream because of the GNOME code guideline restrictions, while at the same time, the benefits are very little. Perhaps some code reviews from GNOME developers, a bit more promotion, but nothing that truly matters in a long run. And yet, it's very crucial for GNOME to have a good set of core apps with active developers because people who are developing apps upstream, it's more probable to contribute in more modules. Um, like GTK. It's psychological thing maybe, but you don't see many contributions from GTK developers that publish a lot on Flathub. So, how you can bring developers in GNOME? Standard procedure, by paying them. Not exactly a standard procedure because the payment is called sponsorship and the budget is a kind gesture of the user community. GNOME could run a model like the Google Summer of Code, where people would submit ideas and projects. One team would review and approve some of them, then they would crowdfunding them and pay developers on completion. Very often we forget that GNOME is actually an organization, which means it's supposed to organize things. And the single duty of the GNOME company, the most important anyway, is to sponsor the GNOME project, which I believe they don't do very well. The second thing is to give application developers some more freedom. It could be things like arbitrary releases. Release when the developers believe there are new things that need to be released, rather waiting six months for the official GNOME schedule and killing the momentum. Third and last, if the previous two fail to attract developers, it's okay, you'll try other ways, but you have to try and you have to keep trying till you succeed. It's the job description of a community. But until all those happen, that most likely it will be on Never Day. Let's examine the alternatives, the system monitors made from the community. Um, I suspect almost everyone knows them already, so I'll go super duper fast. The first is the Mission Center. It's written in Rust and is what I personally use. It might look like the Windows System Monitor, but it is extremely convenient to use. And that might sound a bit stupid and I don't know why. But when you force an application to shut down, it actually shuts down almost immediately. Cool. Really cool. Second on the list is the Resources System Monitor that came only a few months after Mission Center and it is also written in Rust. Immediately you can tell that is much closer to GNOME design language than the Mission Center. It has even a responsive mode and it could easily apply for becoming the default in GNOME. A truthfully beautiful application and a couple of things they worth noting from design point of view is the search that is on bottom rather on top and that super cute info screen if the previous two were looking like a bit too generic for your taste, you have nothing to worry about because community has you covered. System Monitoring Center doesn't try to comply with the GNOME design and instead is trying to look a bit nerd, a bit old school, although in reality isn't because it's written in Python. But the System D services? Precious. So that was everything for now. See you next time. Oh, and if you want to see me getting wet, you need to pay. Okay.
That sounded a bit wrong, but 3D is expensive, so I need new gear already. <laughs> <laughs>